Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Yeah, Chris is not going to be here till six. At this point, we're going to go through the agenda as written, unless there's any objection. First thing would be the approval of the January 7th and the February 4th minutes. Move. All in favor? Aye. Any, opposite, any opposed? And any abstaining? Very good. Motion for both passes. Next is presentations. Up first is Ron Jordan, our uh, lobbyist at large for the city of Richmond. That's exclusive. <laughs> I'll give you a send out. A, we'll, we'll send out a written report that gives more details tomorrow morning. But um, let me start by saying we had a good year at the General Assembly. I see. Anytime you walk over $45 million for CSO is a good year. After all, we've been working on this since Ms. Graziano was a lobbyist. Let me walk through. Let me let me let you, let me walk through some of the things that have, I think would be of interest to you overall, and then come back and finish up with specific items of interest to the city. There were a number of education uh, proposals that the governor put forth that passed. One of the a couple of pieces of that deal with uh, failing schools. The um, he proposed two constitutional amendments. One would have permitted the state board of education to directly charter charter schools, thereby bypassing the um, local school divisions, that constitutional amendment failed. We had a second constitutional amendment that would have allowed the state to take over um, schools, in specific schools and in individual divisions that um, failed to maintain accreditation. Now, while the constitutional amendment passed, he had a bill that also allows that. The bill passed. Uh, there's some disagreement, to, to put it mildly, on whether or not a constitutional amendment is required in order for the state to take over a division, but the bill did pass, it was funded, and the governor has indicated that he intends to go forth with that. The initial target is four schools, two in Petersburg, one in Norfolk, one in Alexandria, uh, that they're targeting for takeover. The, uh, there were a number of initiatives related to it, uh, reading and third grade and the standards of learning assessments in certain scenarios and also the ability of local school divisions to seek waivers from the state, which all passed. Another one I think would be of interest to you is this legislation was passed to allow the State Board of Education to develop regulations to grade individual schools. They'll be getting a grade of A to F. And the initial um, criteria that were proposed by the, by the State Board, um, schools that get uh, a warning on accreditation that I've seen all would get D's at this point. The only ones that would get F's is if you fail accredit accreditation. Um, no major legislation on guns. A lot of a lot of introduced, but nothing passed. Uh, the health exchange. You got it. Um, the federal government will begin operating a, a health exchange under the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act on January 1, 2014. However, the State Corporation Commission will certify insurers and oversee health plans participating in the health exchange. While no one's calling it a hybrid, it's a federally operated exchange for a lot of political reasons, it's a hybrid. Uh, SEC is going to go, is going to regulate the people who go on there. Um, Next item of Medicaid expansion. There was budget language that approved the expansion of Medicaid under the PPACA. However, they, they did some legislative gymnastics in crafting it. The budget language expressly approves the expansion following approval by the uh, 10 member legislative commission of a finding that the Department of Medical Assistance Services has met certain standards. The reason they did this is the uh, Attorney General opined that the legislature could not delegate the authority to appropriate money to a committee or anyone else. 
So the General Assembly went ahead and approved the expansion, appropriated a sum sufficient for the expansion, but then said before the expansion can occur, these conditions have to be met and this legislative committee will certify that the conditions have been met. Con the commissions essentially direct DMAS to seek federal authority to implement um, a number of changes in the uh, Medicaid and the famous programs. They, uh, they must include a benefit design that's similar to commercial health insurance, include participant cost sharing, coordinated purchasing and administrative simplification, and the authority to develop and implement pilots that are designed to improve quality. The reformers must be phased in. The language lays out a three-phased approach for the phase in of them and um, allow continuation of the concurrent efforts, which include the dual eligible demonstration program, uh, the managed care for foster children, and the eligibility enrollment system changes that DMAS is already working with. Now, the, once those sat <coughs> conditions are met, and, and if, if the 10 member committee approves it, then the first group to be enrolled would be those current Medicaid enrollees, in other words, elderly and children, who fall into the adjusted uh, income levels that, that go up to 138% of income. The second group would be, uh, the next group would be the expansion to those in the waiver programs. Uh, and so that's how it would be expanded. It also establishes the what's called the Legislative Medicaid Information and In Innovation and Reform Commission. It's five members from the House Appropriations Committee and five from the Senate Finance Committee. And the expansion can occur until the commission is formally determined that all these conditions have been met. But it's not a majority vote of the committee. It's a majority vote of each group. In other words, out of the five from the House, it takes three from the of the House members voting to approve it and three from the Senate in order for it to go forth. The House has already uh, appointed its five members and none of them are considered friendly to the expansion of Medicaid. The Senate has not uh, named its members yet. <coughs> Can I just be clear? Chairman Zee. Oh, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to know if I are you holding questions on <laughs> That's why I love this form. Um, I just wanted to be clear in terms of who's on first and second with the expansion. It sounds as if those are individuals who are already in the queue as opposed to 400,000 people who are not currently covered by Medicaid. Is that accurate? The first group would be the people who don't meet the income threshold would be the elderly who currently would qualify, but they are above the income threshold. Okay, so it does already reach out it to reach out, those. That's the first group. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, and then the last question. So, we're going to have a hybrid exchange somewhere between the feds in control and the state part. Correct. Is there a model for that? I think we're, there are a number of those <coughs> popping up around the country because it allows uh, certain governors to say that they it's a federal exchange where the state is ensuring that the quality of the carriers who are on the exchange, the consumers in their state are protected by, by putting control of the carriers under their regulatory system. And have we started unbundling? There seems to be some opportunity. Well, have we looked in terms of the city and what the implications are? Because we talked about, at least from the Department of Social Services, that there were some implications in terms of having to do intake and public and all that. I haven't had any more meetings since we have that Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Can we go back to um, schools? Did they talk about anything? I know that the President, Barack Obama, was talking about Head Start because I was thinking that, you know, we have some schools that might be closing and if we're going to have Head Start in like, I guess, four, like four years old or whatever, can we use some of those schools for Head Start? The General Assembly didn't do anything about it um, to deal with Head Start. Head, uh, Head Start is affected by the federal sequestration. Uh, but what you're going to see, and, and so funds for Head Start will be cut by the federal government, but it's going to be a graduated reduction over the next um, rest of the fiscal year. Remember, the federal fiscal year goes through September 30th, and the new one starts on October 1st. So uh, there will be some reduction, 
there's actually going to be some reduction in Head Start uh, as a result of the federal sequestration. I thought the president said that would not be effective. No, that definitely is. That's one of them that is effective. So Title I and Head Start. What is it? Title One, which is uh, another federal pot of money that goes to schools, and <coughs> Head Start. Which is also free and reduced. Free and it goes to schools with free and reduced school, free and reduced school lunch populations, which is 75% of the kids in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank um, that was created by Council Analyst Joyce Davis to provide you with some talking points when you go to your district meetings. So that should be helpful. If you don't have it, let me know and I'll send it to you again. But it was pretty thorough. Thank you. Mr. Jordan, please go ahead. One last thing. There are, when we unbundle this, probably some employment opportunities nested within here because of the navigators yeah. that will be created right. necessarily. The navigator program. Exactly. And so being mindful of that, whether it's with the uh, TANF view program or economic development with uh, Mr. Jameson, that may create some employment opportunities or, you know, for citizens. Uh, if, you, you know, it has to be established, training happen, all like that, but there's some opportunities in there too. Um, At least as best as I can understand it. Should be. I don't yeah, have a I full... Agree. Yet. On school safety, the General Assembly did include um, six million a year for five years to provide grants for school safety equipment. Uh, the grants would be uh, up to up there would be competitive grants up to a hundred thousand dollars and would require a twenty five percent local match. They also included a, a million three in the next the following year in twenty fourteen for grants to hire school resource officers. Uh, we can go to transportation. The omnibus transportation bill, first let me say it, it prohibits tolling I-95 south of Fredericksburg and between Fredericksburg and Sussex County. So you won't have tolls uh, in this area without the approval of the General Assembly. Now the, the approved transportation bill raises one that's fully implemented an estimated $880 million annually. It's a five year implementation. The bill essentially abolishes the per gallon fixed rate retail tax on gasoline, the 17 and a half cent on, on gasoline and diesel, and replaces it with a wholesale tax of three and a half percent on gasoline and six percent on diesel. Uh, this allows the revenues to grow as inflationary cost of fuel rises. It also increases over five years the vehicle titling tax, so it'll rise from three percent to 4.3 percent. It increases the annual electric vehicle fee from fifty dollars to a hundred dollars and makes alternative fueled and hybrid vehicles also subject to the fee, frankly, to capture the loss of gasoline tax revenue from the lower uses there. And finally, it increases the uh, general sales and use tax by 0.3%, so it'll rise from 5% to 5.3%. It also captures revenue from a proposed federal statute called the Marketplace Equity Act. Essentially, it would allow states to tax internet sales. Uh, if, however, if there's some question about whether or not that will actually ever be enacted. So they put a trigger in there that if Congress fails to enact that legislation by a certain point, the wholesale tax on gasoline would increase from 3.5% to 5.1%. Uh, also, um, the amount of the existing general sales and use tax earmarked for transportation increases from 0.5%, a half a penny, to um, 0.675% in the legislation, so there's a, an increase going from general funds. Of importance to the city is the bill establishes the first time a dedicated funding source for mass transit and intercity inter passenger rail. 0.125% uh, generated by a portion of the sales tax increase is earmarked for this purpose with 40% allocated to rail and 60% allocated for transit. Uh, the bill also includes additional tax taxes for Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads. Now these are in, in addition to the, to the uh, statewide increases. Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads will still get part of the statewide increases from the regular formula. But in addition to that, they will also, um, the General Assembly also raise a number of other taxes in those areas 
that will generate approximately 300 to 350 million each year in Northern Virginia and 173 million to 219 million in Hampton Roads. The taxes they increased there, they're increasing the sales tax in both places to 6%, from 5% to 6%. Northern Virginia, in addition, gets a regional congestion relief fee. In effect, it's a recordation tax but 25 cents per hundred dollars of assessed value of real estate. There's no similar one done in the Hampton Roads package. The state also adds another 3% to the transient occupancy tax in Northern Virginia. Don't do that in Hampton Roads. Now, Northern Virginia is free to use the funds for all capital improvements that reduce congestion, including transit. However, in Hampton Roads, spending of these additional funds is really <coughs> excuse me, restricted to bridges, tunnels, and roads, no transit uses. And the reason behind that is there are some very, very large projects that the General Assembly wants to see go to the head of the line down there, not light rail to Virginia Beach. Uh, they want to see the third crossing bill. Any questions, Mr. Jordan? The uh, tax increase is going to affect July 1 of 2013, except for the gasoline tax repeal and the wholesale flip which goes into effect the following year. Um, okay, let me go specific, some specific things to the city, things specific to the city. Combined sewer overflow, uh, the budget conference brought, approved $45 million. It's the largest slug of money we've ever gotten from combined sewer overflow. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not we would be told in the budget, you know, here's your 45 million, go away and never come back. Uh, we had a lot of interesting discussions about that. And uh, essentially what we were told was um, spend the money before you come back. That's true. Does that mean that um, this will help us with the storm water fee? No. No. Storm water fee is used to do some things to our sewer system, but also to uh, help clean the James River, the Chesapeake right. Bay, combined sewer overflow, which was probably state-of-the-line technology 100 years ago, uh, is, is, is now a horrible thing for humankind and nature. And so we're having to do a lot of work on it to make it up to the federal and state levels. This money helps us do that. So what projects, what kind of projects? You may want to get a briefing from Mr. Steidel. Um, essentially what they're going to do is capture more storm water that during the storm stuff goes straight into the river. Essentially what they're going to do is capture more and treat more. Uh, and this is primary treatment. Uh, this is not secondary or, or the, the tertiary. This is, this is capturing stuff, raw sewage that currently goes into the river. Uh, the city still pumps a lot of raw sewage into the river when they're during rain, during rain events, and this will allow them to do that. And Mr. Steidel can give you a really good and interesting briefing on it. I encourage you to to, to get one from him. Uh, and there are some long-term plans as we go forward. When this is all said and done, this will dwarf by far any other project that were undertaken by the city in terms of cost. Yes. The appropriation will it all come in one year? If it will come as the city draws down, it's essentially what the state did. Is the state is going to float bonds and give the city $45 million, but as the, they're not going to give it to the city until the city's ready to spend it. And also, the, the DEQ will closely monitor, and what was made clear to us, remember we've been working on this all during the summer and fall, it was made very clear that uh, it's not intended to allow any diminution of city effort and by reducing general uh, utility funds that are currently going forward. Thank you. Mr. Joshua, you have a follow-up question? Um, are you aware whether or not the city presented uh, sufficient information as it relates to the kind of projects that they need to carry out mm -hmm. that drove this? So my request would be, Mr. President, is that we could ask that that information be used in a way in conjunction with the schedule of projects that said we would anticipate that they would come in mind. Sure. Thank you. 
Mr. Angeloster? Um, <clears throat> for the combined sewer overflow, the 45 million, does it require a match from the city? I feel like somewhere I read that it does require oh, yeah. a one for one match yeah. from Actually, the, city. This, the city. So we have to budget our allotment in order to receive the state's allotment? That's correct, and utilities has plans to more actually put up more than in the required amount of match. Because the, our, so we assume that's going to be coming through this Right, because the project that they're looking at, it's a, about a 10 year project, and if I remember right, it's about a $110 million project. And it still leaves you with half a billion dollars worth of work to be done in today's prices. Mr. Kerr. Do we know um, what, what the projects are and where we do? Mm -hmm. Mr. Steidel can explain it to you better than I. He's got maps and everything else that show, and it's um, they're in it's routing sewage and essentially over to the plant and expanding the plant. Very good. Very good. It's sewage. Um, the uh, you all had in your package a study, a JLARC study of the education funding formula. Um, Senator Dick Sasslaw introduced a, a resolution to have JLARC look at the funding formula. Once it re finally escaped the House Rules Committee, it was reshaped a bit. Essentially, the stud JLARC will now look at studying the efficiency, efficiency and effectiveness of school spending, uh, compare to how Virginia funds and to what extent funds elementary and secondary education to other states and identify opportunities to uh, improve the quality and quant the quality of education in consideration of the funds spent. Um, we expect this study may be expanded to look at some other things. Uh, one of the things that JLARC members can by letter to the chairman ask that certain that new studies be undertaken or current studies be expanded and we're going to be working on that because we do really do want to look at the composite index. Okay, so we might get to look at it through Okay. It's as close as we've gotten to having any kind of study. One question for clarification. Yeah, please. Um, they are, as a part of the effectiveness and efficiency, they are going to be looking at the effectiveness and efficiency of the funding of the formula as well. Is that correct? It doesn't say that. Now, what what will happen, and, and that's where it's a little squirrely. What will happen? That's the broad guidance in the resolution of JLARC. What JLARC will then do is JLARC will take this, they'll develop a scoping document that lays out the scope of the study and present it to the commission for approval. Um, <coughs> we'll meet with them as well as a number of other groups will to try to give them some suggestions for what should be included in the scoping document. And also we'll be talking to a couple of members of the commission, uh, legislative members of the commission, also suggest that it they who's compose on, the deck. Who's on the commission that the framing for us to? Um, you can do that. I'll let you know. Let me do that rather than get into that here. Um, on uh, you, you may remember that the state has had the undesignated reduction in state aid. In other words, you you've got to take a cut. You decide where you want to cut out of your uh, state and local government. And the state had phased that over the last two years. It was still 40, $45 million in the budget and undesignated reductions. Well, the General Assembly removed that, so that's money to the good for you. Um, RMA, the bill failed. On uh, the Commonwealth Mass Transit Funds, there was a bill in to um, implement performance-based funding for mass transit. Uh, the bill is finally passed, uh, bore no resemblance to what originally went in, much due to the efforts of the Virginia Transit Association, which uh, the original bill, which came out of the Department of Rail and Public Transportation, would have created huge fluctuations in funding. And uh, while there still will be perform, they're going to be incorporating performance metrics in the way that they're funded. Uh, the ability, the resultant peaks and valleys that would have occurred in the bill, if we used the formula in the bill, were taken out. Uh, another bill. Yeah. I'm just kind of stuck on the RMA. The bill failed. <laughs> it just 
very, very terminus uh, conclusion there. Um, I'm wondering, you know, this is likely to come up again next year because it came up this year, it came up the previous year. Um, is there anything that this body should be doing proactively uh, to engage the dialogue so that it's a little bit more clear what the Richmond City Council would be interested and willing to do to work with our regional partners? Today? I think that's an excellent question. I think it needs um, a fairly serious discussion. What I'd like to do is probably sit down and talk with you about it and figure out kind of what role we think council ought to play and then maybe talk to the other council members and then have an open discussion about it as well at another council meeting. For tonight though, because the General Assembly just ended, I don't want to try to put it off, but since we do have a year and we do have other items on the agenda tonight, maybe we should talk about that offline and then bring it back up in another meeting. Okay. Um, another bill which is going to, will not affect you all this year, but will affect you as you do budget preparation next year. It provides that if, um, if you contemplate local, uh, discretionary expenditures by members of council, and this, whether it's council or, or local board of supervisors, if your budget includes discretionary money in there for the council of board members to spend at their discretion, then the budget has to specify the specific uses of that money. Uh, that or passed? you hmm? that passed. That passed. That passed. Or you uh, have to uh, amend the budget to allow for a specific use of that money. Mr. We need to talk about that definitely. Yeah, it's not it, we I think we've concluded that it's probably not gonna doesn't it, the bill isn't gonna affect till July first, so it'll affect you when you prepare next year's budget. I, I know, but we give money for national night out. We give money for other things, and if we don't have that already said now, when it gets approved or gets passed by July the 1st, then when these people start writing letters in June and July for the money for the National Night, we can't give it to them because we don't know how many people are going to request that, you know, the money for that. What? So that don't, that don't make no sense. What's the level of specificity? Is it broad categories, youth programming? That's all it says. So it can be broad categories as opposed to um, bolt boxing in the whatever, whatever. So it can be youth, it can be seniors, it can be record, like that. That's why you, it's why you probably want to work on this over the next year to kind of work through that process to decide. Well, you said it was effective Just July 1. No, next year. It oh, was okay. effective, but your budget's already in place you. by then, so it would apply next year. So I got apply you. the preparation next year's budget. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Would you read the broadness of the description again? Essentially, it says that um, any itemized contemplated expenditures in local budgets that include any discretionary funds to be designated by any members, by individual members of the governing body, must include the specific uses and funding allocations planned for those funds by the individual member. There's a way to work. I mean, the general yeah, assembly deals with some of this. Miss Brown. Yeah. Oh, Miss Ali. And um, we knew this was coming. We want to us prepared. And the city attorney has actually worked on this. So we feel confident that um, we will have you prepared in time for the next fiscal year. Once well, the categories are very, I do say the categories are the same across. We're supporting youth activities. I mean, but they're not. This, yeah, this wasn't driven by, this came out of Northern Virginia. Uh, this wasn't driven by anything around here. This was driven by uh, some boards of supervisors in Northern Virginia who had huge, huge discretionary fund accounts at their disposal and were using them before election time to um, give to friends and fans, friends, friends. Well, we, President, we already had that in place. We, we the city was actually held up as a model for how to do this. And how much money do they get per board of supervisor or oh, whatever? We're in, in Northern Virginia, you're talking a lot hundreds of, of thousands. Yeah, we don't get that. <laughs> we get 12. Mr. Arzola, I'm sorry. Is it worth talking to the administration about uh, asking for an exemption from for council on this type of a budget amendment so that we could amend? The budget. language, the, the, the budget was, this, this bill was amended specifically to allow 
Richmond City Council to initiate its own budget amendments for this purpose. It does say that. Mm -hmm. okay. The next item, and I'll get wrap up fairly quickly here. Um, this was directed specifically at the city. The city double tax billboards, tax them as personal property and real property. Uh, bill was passed that uh, says they only can be taxed as uh, tangible personal property, not as real property. Uh, and uh, the city was the only one doing that. And the assessor indicated he was in the process of changing that anyway, so uh, that worked out okay. Um, the last one I highlight for you deals with stormwater management. The bill that was introduced would have uh, prohibited any local locality from enacting a stormwater management ordinance that was more stringent than the state regulations. Um, VML and VACO, that was a home, it was a Home Builders Association of Virginia bill. VML and VACO got behind it, and um, essentially what you'd now have to do is uh, have your um, ordinance reviewed by the Department of Conservation and Recreation uh, if a landowner so requests that it be adopted. A lot of this was directed at uh, the suburban counties and cities because they've got all these stormwater detention structures and the issue becomes who's going to pay for the perpetual maintenance of those. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. George. Any last question? Uh, yes, just one last, and we may have covered this already. Was there something passed uh, that would impact uh, the tax assessments that a CDC, for example, that has a multi-unit uh, dwelling uh, would have to... Uh, Not that I recall. Nothing that's around the assessments. Yeah. The assessment. Yes. Yeah. There was nothing? Not that I recall. I'll check. I thought no, I recall. Mr. Kern? Okay. Did you say you bring that texting while driving? Did that fail? Texting while driving, um, that did pass. That did? I don't remember right. Hold on. I skipped over it. Why did you ask me about that? Did it call the while driving? One of my neighbors for daughters. Yes, it clearly passed. It did pass. Mm -hmm. But it's That's effective in July. Effective to July 1. This year? And that's in the state of Virginia. $250 for the first violation, $500 for the second violation. Okay, now what about um, as far as I think the governor had like, was someone had a problem? Like, how would you report those? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a real possibility that the governor may veto that because the, the governor feels that that uh, violation is already covered by other. Um, statutes. So it's really not passed yet? Right? Well, the General Assembly passed yes. it, but he has 30 days in which to sign it, veto it, or send down. And then one more thing. What about no pass? I mean, you said no pass. The bill that would, if I recall correctly, the bill that would have required a license, vehicle license for a person operating a moped failed. Well, I know that this is right about that. Are they white? Thank you, Mr. Twitter. I really appreciate it. Oh, if there are other questions, please don't hesitate to email Ms. Ali, and she will collect them all and send them to Ron so he's not fielding a million different questions all day long. Ms. Robertson? And Mr. Jordan will provide a copy of his report? Yes, and Mr. Jordan will be providing a copy of the report. Yes, thank you. All right. Mr. Jordan, thank you very much for your work at the General Assembly this year. I can't. I have 45 million reasons to thank you. It was a good year. Up next is going to be the Richmond Strategic Multimodal Plan presentation.